In October of 2016, we took a look at the history of Halloween and its links, plausible or not, to the Irish festival of Samhain. It enjoyed quite the success, and we thought we'd make a follow-up video to address some of the comments that we got. First, our mispronunciation of Samhain. Uh, approximately a thousand people pointed out that while we were criticizing common mispronunciations of the word, we were not getting it right ourselves, pronouncing it something like Samhain. Uh, so we do deserve severe blame because we added to an already quite bad phonological crime the worst crime, perhaps, of pedantry. Another problem that was uh, pointed out to us was that we failed sometimes to clarify the proper distinction between Gaelic and Celtic. Gaelic refers to a language, by extension to a culture, which originates in Ireland and which later spread to Scotland. Um, Celtic refers to a whole branch of Indo-European languages and cultures, which of course does include Gaelic, uh, but also the present-day Welsh, Cornish or Breton. Celtic languages spread in all of Europe, along with the Hallstatt and Latin cultures, spoken by people as far apart as the Picts, the Gauls, the Iberians, or the Galatians. The thing is, Samhain is primarily known to us through its depiction in Irish literature, so our focus was on the Gallic context. But the theories we're examining try to find ramifications in other Celtic texts and practices, so in responding to them we use the two words a bit interchangeably. Someone also criticizes us for speaking of the British Isles, which might seem a surprising criticism to some, but in fact the term is genuinely controversial, especially in Ireland, where it is seen as a sort of purely political denomination which tries to imply that Ireland belongs in the same entity as Great Britain, and that's not really unfounded because until the 16th century, so renewed colonization efforts by the English, Ireland was never really described as British, and for good reason. Uh, Ireland Celtic culture is Gaelic and not Britannic like Britain's. The term is less controversial outside Ireland, obviously, and especially outside the English language. Uh, so in French, our native language, these islands are usually referred to as les îles britanniques without any second thought. So we naturally use the English translation of that, but it might have been more inclusive and simply better to talk of Ireland and Great Britain or maybe of the British Irish Isles when speaking in English. Another controversial topic was human sacrifice. On this, the question is not really, you know, does or did human sacrifice exist? Because it obviously did nor uh, did the ancient Celts kill people during some rituals, because, you know, they very likely did. The question is more whether to believe the accounts coming from the medieval Irish hagiography in connection to Samhain. Caesar and other Roman authors repeating each other serve to illustrate the generally derivative nature of the ancient accounts of such practices and to what degree they can be confirmed by archaeology, which is a point we can also, by analogy, apply to the Irish sources. Although we're not archaeologists, uh, even in the case of a mass burial, it's difficult to prove with complete certainty the sacrificial logic behind the killings. And even so, trying to prove the date on which the sacrifice occurred, that's really beyond us. Someone linked us to a BBC documentary that opens on a cave where 2,600 years ago a lot of people were slaughtered. But they argue they were buried to accompany the death of a chieftain. So assuming that's true, surely it can't be proved that it was a feature of an annual feast like Samhain because it would have, you know, followed the death of the leader, not a fixed or even movable date in the year. When it comes to understanding the problems with the definition of human sacrifice, I think the example of the Roman vessels is probably the most telling. When things turned sour and people thought that the gods were upset in ancient Rome, well, the reasoning was that it must have been because one of these women broke her vow of chastity, and the reasoning was that if you buried her alive as punishment, everything will have, would have to go back to normal. But if you were to go to your ancient Roman friend and, you know, tell him, say, uh, from the outside, these vestal killings, you know, they look a lot like those Carthaginian rituals to Moloch Baal, that you call well, Babric, you know, things are bad, so you, we sacrifice somebody to the gods. And the Roman friend would probably answer that, to his mind, no, that's, it's nothing like that. The, the burying alive is just punishment for the crime they have committed, and that crime might have caused some calamities, but it's not really a sacrifice. Uh, there's a whole process, you know, the, there's a trial, and the vessels, some of the vessels that were accused were even acquitted. And it's, it's probable that some vessels actually had sex at some point, you know, over a millennia, it's a, that's just bound to happen. But from the outside, the obvious reason why they, you know, killed them uh, is that it was really convenient to have this supply of women that you could murder when you needed a scapegoat for something. So the definition gets tricky once you factor in, you know, how they classify different types of death. Does it have to be an offering to an actual deity to be a sacrifice? Or when a common criminal or a gladiator is put to death, is it also human sacrifice? 
And if you just kill someone without a support of your community, isn't it simply a case of, you know, homicide? And if you eat the body, just cannibalism? You know, it doesn't mean that these killings didn't happen, but rather that the distinction between human sacrifice and other forms of ritualized execution generally depends on subtleties in the reasoning behind them that we cannot really distinguish in the archaeological record and that are lost in the somewhat cartoonish accounts that we do have. We also wanted to mention some comments made by Voxiberionica, whom Voxip for short. Uh, like everybody else, they called us out on our criminal mispronunciation of Sawan, but they also doubled down against Ellis by saying that Southon is most probably unrelated to Sawan. Uh, it's a different word entirely, so we were probably a little too shy in our rebuttal. But again, Irish linguistics and phonology, you know, clearly not a strong suit. Um, another thing, we said that the jack o' lantern was brought to the United States mostly thanks to Irish immigrants. Uh, that might be actually a bit of a cliche. Based on research by Liam Hogan, he argued it's probably more of a mix of different customs from Great Britain and Ireland. For example, you could already find tiny plantains in America in 1778. Uh, and, quote, the English antiquarian Jabez Elise remembers seeing them carved by peasant boys in late 18th century Worcestershire. The custom is also mentioned in William Holloway's General Dictionary of Provincialism from 1838, and the first testament linking these practices to Halloween might be uh, John Jamieson's Etymological Dictionary of the Scottish Language, published in Edinburgh in 1808. And in 1859, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle observed that it was the Scots that would be celebrating the festival Halloween. And if you look at early testimonies of Halloween festivities, they're very similar in Graham's British Georgics in 1809, in an Irish peasant cabin in 1834, or in Pennsylvania in 1801, way before the supposedly decisive Irish immigration to America. So it would seem that the modern American Halloween actually borrowed traditions from all over England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, and we should not exaggerate the Irish factor in retrospect. Also, not really a crucial piece of evidence or anything, but we found trace of a sort of jack-o'-lantern in a 1910 French novel, a large hollowed out pumpkin lit from the inside by a candle. Like in Holloway's dictionary, the point is to scare on lookers without direct links to Halloween, and the scene was even illustrated in the school French manual, so, you know, just thought it was neat. So, coming back to Southon, uh, since he is not what it is as a god, to which deity might the Precursion Sawan actually have been dedicated? Well, guessing is anybody's game. For Jean Marcal, for example, it would be Lou. For whatever reason, I guess Lou is an important god. Uh, a popular theory draws from the text of the Second Battle of Maït Huired, where on the eve of the battle around Sawan, uh, the Dacta and the Morrigan meet and they uh, know each other biblically. So, for Arnold Hutton, this festival might have something to do with these two deities. Uh, that was already asserted by Anne de Vries, and relying on Van Vries, he even said that Samhain doesn't actually mean the end of summer, but meeting, and would among other things refer to this meeting between the Dagda and the Morrigan. Persigard even goes as far as saying that a hierogamic ritual, based upon the sacred union of these gods, was performed in Ireland on Samhain, um, which is pretty presumptuous based on this one and only passage. Uh, was there a corresponding ritual for every event in Irish literature? Uh, for Thibault, Samhain wouldn't be the feast of any particular deity, but the feast of the world and the souls inhabiting the world, visible or not. Whatever that means, he might be right about Samhain not having a chief god. One last thing is the possible links to other autumnal celebrations like the Norse festival of Fetionaitor or Martinmas, the feast of St. Martin on the 11th of November. Foxy points out that the 11-day shift to the Gregorian calendar might explain a number of common features and customs associated with both of these holidays and Halloween. And if you subscribe to the hypothesis of the importance of the pastoral year, it's only natural that there is a lot of transversal similarities. So, in conclusion, the sources are a problem for sure, but a bigger problem is that we ask more of them than they can actually give us. Uh, we want a deeper meaning to be given to all these allusions in Irish medieval literature, and we get frustrated when we can't really get a nice, clean-cut reconstruction out of them. So, as is often the case with the Celts, some people tap into ancient Germanic or later Christian custom from roughly the same area to fill in the blanks. While the comparison can be enlightening, I don't think it's always a healthy process, because by cherry-picking among Roman, Norse, or later Christian or even Slavic traditions, well, you can get to pretty much any conclusion you want about these holidays, regardless of the relevant historical record. And when you think about it, you know, isn't that the spookiest thing there is? Happy Halloween to you all.